Professor Lee Cronin, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in Glasgow, Scotland. You hold the Regis Chair of Chemistry at the University of Glasgow and have given over 300 international talks and published over 400 peer review articles in journals such as Nature and Science. And your main interest is in the origin of life and how biology emerged from non-living matter. So uh, how are you doing, Lee? I hear Scotland recently went into lockdown again. So did this... Uh, affect your work in any way or is it just business as usual? Good morning. Um, the lockdown um, will started and um, basically the, the group is going in as normal with some additional precautions to minimize the, the number of interactions on campus and in the lab but because the lab is we're fortunate to have enough space it's possible to socially distance according to the legal guidelines so it's tough who are back in, but everyone's safe, and uh, which is the best news, but um, also good news is we're able to continue doing science, and some of the, the genesis engines I've got, or selection engines, as I probably, it's better to call them, are also starting to run now. Well, before we find out about your fascinating work, let's just hear a little bit about your background. Lee, did you always have an interest in science, and in particular, the question uh, of how life came to be? Yeah, I've always been interested in science since I can remember, you know, since I was, I suppose, five, four, five, six years old, where I can recall those memories. And I don't think the the origins question was there. In fact, I mean, I'm, mm. I must confess I'm not interested in the origin of life or what did happen. I'm more interested in what does happen, because I think the process that gave rise to the origin of life is ongoing right now. So I guess I'm... I've always been deeply interested in how things work in the universe, and one of the things that um, mystified me is basically the mechanism for um, selection and evolution in the universe, and I've always been interested in causation. And I think that's, you know, there's a lot of, I've done a lot of um, kind of introspection, been thinking about how I got to where I am in terms of why am I interested, and I can just remember as a, as a child, trying to manipulate, you know, the sun, photons, reflecting things through bits of glass and hmm. understanding how things interact with each other. And um, I guess I've always wanted to understand how the universe works. And um, what is more fundamental about asking how the universe works, which is about asking how life got started and is it, how is that process working now? So, the search for the origins of life, also known as abiogenesis, is nothing new. Uh, for those who don't know, can you give us a brief overview of the experiments that have been conducted leading up to your first experiment in 2011? Yeah, so the origin of life or looking at abiogenesis is not, is not new. It's been going on for hundreds of years, you can, thousands in fact. Um, mm. I suppose in recent history, you might, the, the people who are trying to think about how matter could be animated and I suppose in medieval times there was a kind of morbid fascination with life and death it still is so there are people thinking that you know that life could just spontaneously generate and um, you know because people saw suddenly bacteria growing or maggots growing and things like that um, but then that was shown to be you know a, a fallacy that you, you life cannot spontaneously generate uh, in inorganic stuff but the irony is really that, that, that uh, and we'll talk about that, is it actually does. Um, but let's talk about the experiments. So people looked at the kind of inorganic stuff becoming alive, and then as we went through to the kind of 17, 16, 17, 1800s, obviously alchemists wanted to turn metal into gold, base mm -hmm. metals into gold, so they were kind of thinking about how to, whether matter had some kind of essence. And then 
when we started to get really serious about chemistry and understand how chemistry works, people started to do very fascinating experiments with what happens in a soup of chemicals. And the first of those was really happening, say, in the 1950s, where two guys, Miller and Urey, decided to do the Miller-Urey experiment, which was literally takes the simplest things you could imagine, some methane, so that's kind of that's what, what the simplest gas molecule that will burn on Earth is, just one carbon atom and four hydrogens. Some ammonia, that's the simplest nitrogen-based atom, that's one at nitrogen, three hydrogen atoms, which is used mm -hmm. for fertilizer and then some water, H2O, so water is all around, um, and some hydrogen, H2, one of the most you know simple yeah. gases in the universe, put it all together in a bell jar with, um, and just have two electrodes and zap the material to simulate you know, um, lightning and kind of other reactions going on of you know, thousands of volts, literally 50 thousands of volts. And when they did that, um, they found that there was a soup of molecules made, like the primordial soup, as they called it. That was in the 1950s. In the 60s and 70s, sugar chemists started to look at very simple reactions that would make very simple sugar molecules and take formaldehyde, which is the simplest kind of aldehyde, and then do reactions with that would like make sugar-like molecules and make a mm. big gooey mess. So there's been lots of reactions and stuff like that. And then going on into the 80s and 90s, people have been doing soup experiments with, with DNA and RNA to see if you could make kind of genes spontaneously in the test tube. And then also have looked at the components of RNA and DNA and said, can these molecules be made in the laboratory easily? And I have, you know, views on all of this, and, and people have been trying to string them together to try and come up with a plausible mm. route that connects G the dead Earth, no organic chemistry, to a biological Earth uh, that we have now. Right, and I remember when you were talking about spontaneous generation, seeing, uh, even as a kid in er early science books, this idea that uh, you, if you put some, some rubbish out, rats will appear. It, is, it was basically that, wasn't it? Basically, yeah. So spontaneous <laughs> generation really was, you know, you, there were biological materials inside the container which were basically uh, decaying, and you know, there may yeah. if the flies had been there, there were there were there were larvae that turned into maggots, and there were, or if it was uh, um, just bacteria or fungi, they would grow. So they were already present, and it was showing if you sterilize the material then obviously nothing would grow because everything was dead. So spontaneous de generation uh, was ruled out. But what I, my comment I made about spontaneous generation is, of course, spontaneous generation does not occur without mm. evolution. But if you have mm -hmm. a few, if you have some time, you can get evolution into um, biology. So on a billion year time scale, spontaneous mm. generation using evolution is the answer on a quick time scale, spontaneous generation is just misunderstanding biology and the seeds that are in the system. Well, you conducted your own experiment, the first of many, in 2011, an experiment known as Inorganica. But before you tell us about that, is it appropriate to define life? Uh, and if so, how would you define it? It is appropriate to attempt to define life, but I think um, the problem with defining life is more arguments have gone into defining life than actually making it. Mm. And the problem is it's hard to um, define something you don't, you can't really make or understand. It's like saying define an automobile. What is an automobile? Um, well, an automobile was defined by, you know, the people that first generated them. Is an automobile defined by four wheels, a steering wheel? No, no, you could probably move around in a, on a, with a car without four wheels. You could do it with three wheels or five wheels. Do you need a steering wheel? No, you could have a couple of levers. So the problem is we, people got themselves um, confused about the definition and, the fu and, and the, what is the core definition and what is the functional definition and what is the kind of add-on definition. And so I find that really arguing about definitions of life then led you into, oh, well, we need this and this and this. No, let's define an automobile. Let's define, well, we need wheels. We need a steering wheel. We need an engine. We need an exhaust pipe. Well, if it's an electric car, you don't need an exhaust pipe. If you use levers, you don't need a steering wheel. If you, don't, if you decide you're not going to use four yeah. wheels and you have more, you can have eight wheels, right? So suddenly your definition <laughs> of your car has no meaning, yet 
what does the car, what do you do with a car? We get in it and you travel from A to B. So what I decided to do is rather than get trapped in this loop of mm. what is life defined by and how do I make life in the lab, I'd say, well, what universal thing characterizes all life on Earth that we know of and probably all life in the universe? Is there one such thing? And I realized very quickly there is, and that is life um, is uniquely, uniquely um, defined by its ability to generate complexity um, via evolution. And what I mean by, and what is a prerequisite for complexity, that is functional information. So life right. generates functional information. And if you could have a measure for functional information, you could say if something is alive or dead. So a virus, does it have functional information? Yes. So a virus is, on by their definition, um, alive. And you go, but viruses aren't alive, but let's go on. Does a fly have functional information? Yes, a fly is alive. Then when you start to say, oh, there are some things that have functional information that are not metabolically alive. Uh -huh. What connects them and what connects them all is evolution. And so what we need to do is to say, oh, let's not look at life per se, because there's lots of different types of life, metabolically alive things, viruses, mm -hmm. uh, AIs. Where do they all come from? Well, they are all connected via the chain of evolution. So viruses could not exist without Darwinian evolution. They are related to the, all, the, the, all the living organisms on Earth. Human beings are also similarly related. Donkeys, you know, uh, and, and uh, classes of animals that can't reproduce anymore and therefore are not genetically alive anymore, dead ends if you like, but we're all unified by the, the fact that evolution made us. And that I think is a new definition that I would like to put out there to say, hey, let's not worry about whether a virus is alive or dead, because of course, if you're unlucky enough to have COVID, when, that, that, when those COVID virus particles are inside your cell, they have hijacked the cell and they are alive for that moment in time. And then when they eject the cell and they're going out to infect someone else, they are not alive at the, metabolically, but they have the potential to be alive. And I think that's a very important distinction, but we need to understand that the connection, the hard connection, the irreducible connection is evolution. Well, on this channel, Lee, we talk about the science of biological evolution and in many of the debates that we see between evolutionary scientists and evolutionary skeptics, such as creationists, the skeptics will usually end up saying, well, we may not fully understand evolution, but you can't tell us how life began, to which the evolution proponent will respond, that's abiogenesis, not evolution. Those are two different things. Stick to the topic. But Lee, you're saying that these things are actually inextricably linked. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think that the, 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 they are linked. And the problem with the debate that creationists all have to try and disprove evolution through complexity mm. is that they are creationists in general that do this are, um, they're not taking part in the discussion in a way that is, a, is a, an argument that means that, that you can change someone's mind. If you have an argument with someone, then the, for me, the prerequisite of an argument is that you have a point of view you believe in, mm -hmm. but when the, your point of view is shown to be inconsistent with the evidence, then you are willing to revise, revise that point of view. What mm -hmm. creationism is, is, creationism over the last 50 years, is just evidence of, the, 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 of a body of people that don't want to accept um, the um, method of con dialogue logical discussion, you know, is my axiom correct, yes or no, and then move on. They are trying to muddy the waters with um, questions and lack of information has been evidence of, of uh, uh, their point of view. But what they don't understand is science, the process of science, is about explaining where you don't know. That's it. You know, I I'm, I'm, reason I'm focusing in on a biogenesis is because we don't know how that works scientifically yet and we're trying to um, uncover the mechanism. The creationists will say, look, evidence that of the creationist viewpoint. I'm like, no, no, evidence of the scientific method. It's like we didn't know how to land rockets on legs, but we knew it was possible. Mm -hmm. And then Elon Musk with SpaceX worked out the mechanics of 
land, 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 landing the rocket on legs. It's a very hard thing to do, use technology. So I think the problem I have with the creationist debate is that it isn't a debate, it is a religious cult. And if you're not able to question it, and the questioning is, is, is done unprofessionally, illogically, and with malintent, then you're not going to have a productive discussion. So I think that I find that most creationists, it's very easy to talk to them and say, look, if you're not willing to debate the actual thing we're doing in the lab, and what that, mm -hmm. what that means in the, the divide between falsifiable hypothesis, which mm -hmm. means it's falsifiable, and faith, then you have a problem. Because what I'm not saying as a scientist, I'm not saying people who are religious are stupid. I'm saying people who have a religion or have a mm -hmm. faith, faith by definition is in something that can't be falsified. Whereas the origin yeah. of life is a hard problem but the experiments can be falsified. So the creationists, in a way, are in, they're in a sticky wicket because they're always going to lose because, you know, it's like adopting a point of view, and so they're always on this adversarial front. So I think there's a contradiction there they try and make doesn't exist. It's a bit like the way you would convince someone in the fake news. You just bombard them with ever more outrageous examples of the thing that you want, your, the thing that you want to argue against and then use that as a straw man. So I think we need to take it down and say, what is your faith? What is the science doing? And how is the science and the faith interacting together? And that you can have a really interesting discussion with theology. And that is actually happening between science and theology. But creationists are just like a parasitic cult um, that they don't have anything to add to the dis debate other than they're a virus on religion, right? In the same way viruses exist in biology. What are they doing? They're meant to sow kind of, you know, mm. skepticism in uh, in the wrong way, you know, well, not skepticism, they're supposed to pretend to be skeptic, but so are fanaticism. It's okay, you can very easily cut down these discussions by, by reason and debate, and when people start ad hominem on you, then you know that you've won and they've lost. But it's not about winning and losing, it's about critical thinking and giving evidence. And Finding the answer. It, the, yeah, exactly, narrowing down the space in which your hypothesis works. Um, you know, it would be really interesting if um, we were able to make a life form tomorrow, but it's going to be hard to make a life form, but we will be able to show the mechanism of evolution in the same way we see that evolution is working on Earth right now. In fact, indeed, it's working in real time. And the way the UK locked down and didn't lock down allowed the virus to mutate. Because why? Well, there's two arguments here. Let me take a segue. America didn't lock down like the UK. South Africa didn't lock down like the UK. Um, so mutation of the more um, uh, uh, virulent viruses didn't emerge. Why? Because people were exchanging the virus freely, people were getting ill. Lots more people died in, in, uh, have died, sadly, in the US. Um, mm. Now, of course, the proportion of death in the UK is actually quite high, in fact, the highest right now. Now, why has that happened? Well, there's demographic reasons, but we locked down, then unlocked down, and locked down and not locked down. And when you went through uh, cycles of amplification of mutation mm -hmm. and propagation, and that was a really, I think that would turn to be a hard thing to see for society. But that was evolution in action right before your eyes. Like a weird Petri dish, <laughs> in a way. Yeah, <laughs> uh, fortunately, the vaccines seem to be robust, touch wood, against the mutations that have come out. And we will need to revise the vaccines in a mm -hmm. couple of years. But the good news is the UK have done a brilliant thing after making the mistakes or, well, that's not mistakes, after what's happened, it's really sad. You know, over 110,000 deaths in the UK, I think mm -hmm. it is now, uh, where we stand on the, in February 23rd. Um, but we've vaccinated almost 17 million people. As mm -hmm. soon as we vaccinate, and, and so that means our death rate should drop dramatically. Of course, this isn't a competition with other countries about who's the best, who's the worst. It's about saving humans. And also, it's about looking at how evolution and epidemiology interact and our cultural interactions. But that's a bit of a segue. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, take us through the Inorganica experiment. Now, if I had been in the lab with you that day, uh, what would I have seen? So, Inorganica was really, it's really three separate experiments. And they're still going on now, but there were three ideas. The first one was to try and do, take the Miller-Urey experiment, which is what I told you, a really basic experiment using gas and water. 
but to add in a very big missing component, which was the Earth's crust. Because you need a solid material, almost like you needed a, a you know, in the first gramophone, the first record was uh, wax. You could record the sound in the wax in a rotating disc. Right. That wax was able to store the sound waves on that disc so they could be played back. In the Miller Year experiment, we couldn't get very much complexity because there's nowhere to store that the information in the soup. It kept getting reset. It's like kept being erased. It's like you go into a cave and you start say a word and it echoes. The echo will die over time. You need a way of storing that echo. So what I did with Inorganica, the first one was to say, right, let's put inorganic materials into the Miller and start to record those echoes so those mm -hmm. echoes could influence the future and to start to build an evolutionary dynamic. Then the second experiment with Inorganica was an attempt to start to um, manipulate the environment by programming the environment like you'd program a computer. So in the same way you could program a computer to do certain things, and in Organica the idea with the program was to change the Earth's crust systematically through different mineral uh, worlds. So you could put the material through the pyrite world, which is a, a, a kind of mineral of, um, of iron, then maybe through some kind of copper mineral world, and, and so on and so forth, and go through those. And then the third experiment was an experiment where we had, we were making cells, blobs if you like, of oil and water, like salad dressing, and seeing how these oil and water blobs could start to evolve on their own spontaneously um, it, by shaking them and providing some energy and some disequilibrium. So inorganic was really the dream to kind of see evolution in the inorganic world, amplify it in the changing the environments in the organic world and then ending up with cells. So we can go from sand to cells because that's what had to happen at the origin of life. And that's what the Miller-Urey experiment, uh, and I suppose some others missed out, was the inorganic elements. Yeah, I mean, the, so, and of course, all these experiments are really simple models. And if you think back then, it was a really big paradigm shift for people to think that you could make so many molecules from just such a simple experiment, mm. but then, the, the vast space of molecules that was possible can be reduced down by having the inorganic materials because they would amplify some reactions at the expense of others because they would add constraints. It's a bit like um, if you say, I'm going to mm. I'm going to go to a waterfall and I'm going to drink water. Well, if you don't have a bottle, you could use your hands. But with your yeah. hands, the water will be spilling out everywhere. There are the constraints. If you have a bottle, that acts as some constraints. You can boundary condition. You can fill up the bottle with the water and then drink it. And it's understanding how those constraints can be used in chemistry to stop all the reactions spilling out everywhere, contain them in a bottle, if you like, so you can get to do one type of reaction or a subset of re possible reactions and see what happens in time. So let's say that we do get the answer, the answer to how life began. Now, there are bound to be critics out there that are saying, Lee Cronin, you are going to destroy the mystery of life. As human beings, we need that. Uh, so what, what do you say to this criticism? I'm going to destroy the mystery of life? No, I don't think so. I mean, it's like saying that, um, you know, Watson and Crick destroyed the mystery of life when they found um, the, double, the structure of the double helix with Rosalind and Franklin's uh, data. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that science is about elucidating things and getting mechanisms. So from that point of view, it's about us ma making progress. But the mysteries are all there. The mysteries don't exist in science. The mysteries exist in our heads, right? Mm -hmm. so DNA always existed um, for biology. It's just that we didn't understand it. And so by keeping that mystery, um, we weren't we're not able to understand genetic disease, um, how we decay, how life gets going. You know, I think that we have to really be very careful about what we say is a valuable mystery. So I think there are really important things in the universe, but, you know, we need to understand where life is going on Earth. How precious is life on Earth? Is there, how um, populated is the universe with other life? Mm. And I think once some of these experiments is absolutely critical, we do them because we want to know how alive the universe is. And, you know, in the same way that when we first realized that stars were powered by hydrogen and not coal, that did not destroy the mystery of the stars and the sky, it allowed us to work out how big the universe was and what is the rate of star genesis. 
So um, for those people that say I'm destroying the mystery, I don't th think that's the right question. I would say, oh my gosh, I'm helping us understand the wonder. So I think that wonder is more positive than mystery because <laughs> mystery has a rather negative connotation at the end, doesn't it? Uncertainty, fear, where wonder is like, my God, it actually works. If you look at double-stranded DNA and you see it unwinding, you think that that's happening in my cells all the time as it's being read out, as the cells are replicating. That's yeah, just like mind-blowing that that works. So, yeah, okay, if I can replace mystery with wonder, then I think that that's probably a good thing. But I'm not in the wonder mystery game. I'm in the science un reducing uncertainty game. Lee, is there a theory that can help us tell if something has interacted with a living system or not? A bit like a signature of life. And if so, how would that work? I mean, this, this is one of the things that I kind of theories that I built a few years ago. I've been, in fact, probably been building it since I'm five years old. Um, and I'll tell you about how I built it quickly. I used to be obsessed mm -hmm. about minimal minimal survival kits. I used to like I used to go like going out in, in the outdoors and things. And I was wondering about what is the minimal amount of information I would need to survive on my own, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I could take a box, right, of all the you know things I need: a first aid kit, some water bottles, or maybe water purification, some ways to to get food, catch animals, you know, grow vegetables, catch fish, whatever. And then I thought, well, how can I make this thing smaller? So how, what is the minimum set of tools I would need to create the tools that would create the tools to create the tools to create the tools, you know, if I got transported to that desert island? And then I, I, using that imagination, I thought, if I take a molecule or anything, can I use this technique to find out if that molecule was built by a, a genetic system, built by evolution? And the, the cut a long story short, the answer is yes, because there are some things in the universe. If I take, say, my iPhone, my iPhone, if you went to Mars and found um, an iPhone yeah. and you could see it turn on, you say, well, that clearly, and, and using the word has a creator is really bad in the connotation of creationists, but let's just say it was made by a system. It's made by human beings. It's a technology, yeah. technological artifact. Information was required. In the same way, if you found the molecule Taxol, which is one of the most complicated natural products that human beings have identified in nature, that molecule was made by biology, by the Pacific yew tree. So this molecule, although it has normal, it looks like normal, a normal molecule, that molecule could not be made randomly in a primordial soup. It was just too complicated. It's like saying, I expect to stir if I take the iPhone and grind it up into atoms and put it yeah. in a pot and shake it, if I shake that pot, will an iPhone ever come out? Ever, ever, ever? No. The, the, the probability of that happening is precisely zero. Not very small even, just zero. Mm. So what I realized is when I was grinding up in my iPhone in my head, how many steps are there to grind up the iPhone? Du, 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 du. So how many unique features? Like how many steps did I need my survival kit? So how many things do I need to do to build the tool, to build the tool, to build the tool, to build the house, yeah. right? So it's a, basically the minimum number of pieces of information. That tells me about the amount of memory required. And basically, evolution requires memory. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm, I developed a theory called assembly theory, which basically says, given any object or any um, state mm -hmm. of stuff, I can calculate rigorously whether that object or state was created by the process of evolution. And that's kind of hard, right? You think, well, what do you mean? Well, I could, let's just say the molecule was made in my cell. Well, I could say if that molecule was created by the number of steps related to a genome, let's say I go to my workshop and I build some artwork. Mm -hmm. That artwork was built by me, and therefore that artwork was created by evolution because I'm created by evolution. There's a chain of events. Artwork, Lee, Lee's parents, Lee's grandparents, they're you know, going all the way back to the last universal ancestor of life on Earth. You're, you're was, talking about an evolution detector of sorts. So exactly. So what this is, basically when I find objects, identical copies, number one is required, of objects in any abundance mm. of molecules, and I find that they have um, a number of unique features, 
I can basically tell you how evolved they are. And the more unique fe features they have, the more the evolution, it's like an evolution speedometer. <laughs> so I can say zero okay. evolution, 1,000 miles an hour. And I can measure that in the lab. And that's really exciting because that means we can measure yeah. it in the lab, we can go to our space, we can go anywhere in the universe and measure whether evolution has occurred or not. It's like we've built like a gravity detector, but for evolution. Well, speaking of the lab, you and your laboratory, the Cronin Group, continue to work on this thought-provoking and important question. But you are also involved in digitizing chemistry. So uh, what is that all about? So, so I realized very early on that when I wanted to kind of build a system that would look at the amount of information required to get evolution going, I mm -hmm. should view evolution a bit like a computer program, and I needed to basically look at the number of variables and how those variables would change in space and time. And human beings can only do so many experiments per day, and we might need to do literally countless trillions of experiments. And so I realized the experiment is probably out of reach of manual labor. Um, and so because I've built a new theory for life, which is that um, life um, produces mm -hmm. complexity from evolution and the memory in the universe, which is created in stuff. It's not like a, a vague thing. It's a concrete thing. Then I could come up with a model of that to say how much memory, how much stuff. And I then... Then I was able to make a measuring device to then make this measuring device and then I could then go in the lab and actually make it. Now it's a bit like the Large Hadron Collider to find the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is the boson associated with gravity, one of the most important forces in the universe. How did they do this? Well, number one, they had a theory, the standard model of physics, which predicts the Higgs boson. Number two, they then looked at that theory and estimated the energy range in which that boson would be created to search, to collide particles together. So then they built the collider and the detector in that energy range, and they then did the experiment and looked for the, um, the signature. And once they got above the threshold, they were able to say for sure, we've discovered a Higgs boson. Now think, I've got a theory for life. Mm -hmm. I can make a model. I can work out roughly where to look. I then build the machine. I then run the machine to find the signature of life. But in doing the calculation, I realized the machine required, required many more operations mixing together liquids and solids mm -hmm. and things than a human being could feasibly do in a lifetime. So I decided to make a programming language for chemistry and make a robotics for, for chemistry. And that's what we did. And, and in the process, I've made the first universal robot that does chemistry. And of course, when I was saying to people, can I have money to make robots for origin of life? They said, no. I said, well, can I have money to make robots to discover new drugs? And they went, that's a better idea. <laughs> Do that. And so I built the digital chemistry system to initially mm -hmm. discover new drugs. So in my lab, I have a drug discovery system that makes molecules. But then obviously, I was then asked for permission to repurpose that technology mm. to, for the origin of life, which was my initial ambition. But it's a bit like, you know, Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, um, but really to make money, he has to go into orbit and service the space station, put yeah. satellites in and give internet and GPS. So he's using SpaceX as a vehicle to make money so he can have his dream to go to Mars. I'm using the digitization of chemistry as a vehicle to solve drug discovery problem and make human health better. And then my reward for that is to get to use technology to find out if there's life in the universe. So I think it sounds a, as though you're saying you could 3D print your prescription or something. Is that right? Uh, not quite 3D print, but I would say <laughs> like almost analogous to that. Take a code like in a 3D printer file, put it in a robot and then make your drug. Interesting. Lee, if your purpose is to get one particular message across to the world, uh, what would it be? I think the most important thing is that the, there, there isn't really a mystery of the origin of life, right? I think we're looking at it all wrong. I think what we're trying to understand is um, my, my very strong inclination based on the science at the moment is that we can generalize evolution beyond biology. So biology, so the one message I'm trying to say in a very concrete way is that biology did not create evolution evolution created biology and what biology has done is massively sped up that process of evolution and evolution isn't just a vague term of 
progress in time. It's about the universe storing memories about the past that can be used in the future to direct actions. So in a chemical system, the chemistry can remember what happened a few days before and use that information to then change, to react differently tomorrow than if those few days had not happened. So all that evolution is, is the amount of memory in the universe or associated with an agglomeration of matter. So take Earth. Earth has been 4.7 billion years old. It started very chaotically as the birth of the planet cooled down a bit. Chemistry was able to go. Chemistry basically then was able to read out the state of the Earth at the time and record that information. And then biology emerged, transformed the Earth, made it more comfortable for biology. Biology flourished, 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 and then we got to human beings and the end of technology. And so what I'm trying to say to everyone is that life probably, probably, because mm -hmm. we don't know for sure, mm -hmm. but the data is looks pretty um, exciting. That life is a property of the universe in the general sense. There's life everywhere. And that life is created by the process of evolution. Mm -hmm. And that we should really be um, thinking about how to find life elsewhere in the universe and what that might mean if ev the emergence of life on Earth is as common as the birth of a star in the universe. And I think that is the kind of the main thing I want to get people really comfortable with, that this isn't just some kind of science fiction fantasy. It's liable to be a fact. Some people on the scientific side will be much more conservative than me, say, oh, we only have one point. That's heretical or not heretical because it's not, I'm not breaking the laws. I'm just saying I'm making some assumptions that this process of evolution mm -hmm. is more strong than others might determine. And people on the other side might say that's impossible. You know, God made life on Earth. God made the universe. God made Earth. But what I'm trying to say is that there is science we can do right now. We're doing, we're uncovering that mechanism of evolution, and we're seeing it right now. And so I'm really excited because really I'm discovering. Uh, I mean, okay, I feel really kind of really arrogant to say you know like discovery of gravity because obviously Newton was a a massive figure, but there were other figures along with Newton at the time that, you know, Hooke and so on, and Leibniz, yeah. Leibniz sorry. Um, what I'm saying is the discovery or the, or the um, realization that evolution is like gravity. E gravity is a force in physics, one of the four fundamental forces yes. there in, or across the entire universe. I'm not saying evolution is a mechanical, sorry, a force. I'm saying that evolution is a common phenomena when you have matter and bonds and molecules and polymers mm. because those objects are able to store information about the past to affect the future. And that mechanism gives us life, complexity, technology, and consciousness. And that's it. That's the in a nutshell. Well, this has been such a fascinating dive into the world of life, non-life, and evolution. It's something I've always wanted to do on this channel, and I'm really pleased to have been able to have you on the show to talk about your amazing work. I will leave links to your social media, writings, and, of course, TED Talks in the description below. And hopefully, Lee, we can have you back on again one day in the not-too-distant future. Thanks very much. It's really been a pleasure to be on to kind of discuss how we're searching for the, the, the emergence of evolution in the universe and uh, I hope that people who have listened and seen this uh, found it uh, thought-provoking. <laughs>